I want to say as I get started that I've only been here for a little over 24 hours, but I feel like I have been made to be a part of the AUP family. So I want to thank you for graciously welcome, welcoming me here into your home. So now I feel like your home is my home as well. Before I get started, I want to just express my appreciation for the spirit of prayer that is here on this campus. I have met so many wonderful leaders, spiritual leaders, both of faculty and students, and one of the things that they all have in common is the spirit of prayer. During a week of spiritual emphasis like this, it is very important to be reminded of the importance of prayer. And I so very much appreciate the time that we spent on our knees earlier this morning. Uh, so often, it becomes just a mere routine, a practice, something that people feel they are supposed to do. So we say a quick prayer and we rush through the worship experience. But it is very important for us to remember, as you already know, that the most important element of worship is communion with God. The most important aspect of our coming together is to dialogue with our Creator. And as you have been doing this, I just want to express appreciation for that, and I know that we will continue to do that very same thing. As you already heard this morning, this week we are focusing all of our messages on an aspect of divine activity. You've already heard the outline of the sermons for this week. And I find, I believe that you will find that they will be very easy to remember because each title has only four words in it. And the first three words are the same. The last word is the one that will differ. And this morning, as you already know, the title of the message is The God Who Sees. Each message will come from an aspect of scripture. It will be very easy to identify, uh, either because of the story or the background of the story. So without speaking any more uh, in an introductory fashion, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, Thank you so much for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. We thank you for the songs that have been sung, the prayers that have been prayed, and we just thank you for what we will continue to experience this morning, this afternoon, and for the remainder of this week. So I ask first that you will speak to my heart. I then ask that you will speak to the hearts of each person who is assembled here in this room. And as a result of this worship experience, I pray that we will all see you more clearly and love you more and be determined now more than ever to live lives that will honor you both as we worship you and as we live for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Although I have not opened the scripture yet, I just want to start with some introductory words about what we're going to talk about. Because you may find what we are saying to be a rather strange way to start a week of prayer. Because in the first story that we will look at, and you will discover, by the way, as we proceed through these messages, we will start in the book of Genesis, and we will finish in the book of Revelation. 
But in this morning's message, we discover a lot of very strange themes. Strange from the perspective of these are not things that we would normally talk about during a week of prayer sermon, and, and especially not in the very first sermon. Because in the story that we will examine today, we find barrenness. We find infertility. We find a questionable solution to the problem. We also see family strife, professional strife, envy, jealousy, cruelty, and separation. And believe it or not, we find all of these themes in the first six verses of the chapter. But I do not want to focus on the first six verses of Genesis chapter 16. I would much rather we spend the balance, the entirety of this sermon on the final nine verses of this chapter. Lest you wonder what I'm talking about, I want us this morning to consider the story of Hagar. So often when we study the book of Genesis, certainly this section of Genesis, we focus on Abraham. We may even focus on Sarah, his wife. But how often do we talk about the person that we often look down on in the story? Because we love to talk about Abraham. We love to talk about the growing faith of Sarah. But Hagar, especially since there are some things that are said in this chapter that are not very pleasant because she despised her boss. She despised the one to whom she was to answer. As the story continues, most if not all of you are very familiar with the story, Hagar flees from Sarah. We understand why she did that because Sarah came to Abraham and said, what are you going to do about this situation? And Abraham says, do whatever you want to do about it. So, as the story proceeds, Hagar cannot take this any longer. She decides that she is going to flee. Now, it is easy for us to say that she brought this on herself. After all, she was the one who could do for Abraham what Sarah was unable to do. Or certainly that is how it was perceived as the story starts. But when we take a look at what's going on here, truth be told, the separation probably would have happened eventually. And now as we move into these last nine verses of this chapter, we see Hagar. She's no longer in a place where she knows her bread and her water are sure. Now, she is afraid. She is lonely. She has no support. She has no hope. She has no future. And this is where we pick up the story, the rest of this story. In Genesis chapter six, uh, 16, Genesis chapter 16, and we will begin reading at verse seven. Interestingly, when we look at verses seven, eight, and nine, each one starts in the very, essentially the same way. It talks about the angel of the Lord. Verse seven, verse nine, the angel of the Lord. Verse 10, 
the angel of the Lord, we will see a theme here in these verses. Because the reality is, when we read chapter 16, the story is not about Abraham. The story is not about Sarah. The story really is not even about Hagar. The story is about the Lord. Look at verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her, referring to Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, referring to the angel of the Lord, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you gone? The story continues. The angel of the Lord says in verse 8, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Now, as you have read these verses, there may be something that strikes you as interesting. Perhaps if it never struck you, you are seeing it right now. I ask you, it's the professor in me to ask questions. And I suppose as students, you are accustomed to receiving questions. So I will ask you right now the most elementary of questions. The angel speaks. The angel speaks to Sarah and how many questions, uh, excuse me, speaks to Hagar and how many questions does the angel of the Lord ask her? The angel asks her two questions. But when Hagar responds, how many questions does she answer? She only answered one question. She only answered the first question. Well, the angel asked her, where have you come from? Hagar said, I am fleeing from Sarah. I was there, and now I am here. But there was one other question that the angel asked. Where are you going? Hagar does not answer this question for a very simple reason. She doesn't know where she's going. I know where I was. I know where I am. But I don't know where I will be. I know the past. I know the present. But I don't know the future. Hagar, again, is afraid. She is lonely. She has no support. She has no hope because she doesn't know her future. And that's where the story really starts to get good. How can such a story be a good story when you have no hope, when you have no future? Well, this is where God steps in to the story. Verse 9, then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Then the angel of the Lord said further, do you see a theme here? This story is about the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, verse 11, said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. 
His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then, here comes a key verse of this story. Verse 13. Then she, Hagar, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who what? Who sees. You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? I have seen God, and the God that I see is the God who sees everything. Notice what's going on here. Hagar could only see her past. Hagar could only see her present. But the one thing that she could not see, God could see. She could not see tomorrow, but God already saw tomorrow. And suddenly, the light dawns for Hagar. I can't see it, but that's all right. Because while I can't see, I know that there is a God who does see. That's the story of Hagar. This morning, I ask, what's your story? What's my story? What is our story? What is it that God sees? I would suggest several things for our short amount of time here this morning that God sees. And they are all contained here in the verses that we've already read. I wanted to read the verses so that we could focus on the application. I would suggest several things here this morning, four of them. I would first of all suggest that God sees that we are generationally shaped. In other words, we are shaped by our past. You read it there in verse 8. For the angel asked her, Where are you coming from? And Hagar is fleeing not just from Sarah, but she's fleeing from her past. She's fleeing not just from a physical location, she is fleeing from a situation. She is not only fleeing from the people in the past, she's fleeing from her own past. We are where we are as a result of the past. However, in some situations, we had no control over that. Because the Bible makes it plain that we, Psalm 51 verse 5, we were born in sin. We were shapen in iniquity. We had no control over that. We were born in sin. It was our sinful nature that we inherited because we were sinful from conception. We did not have to sin in order to become sinners. We sin because we are sinners. It's our nature. We do what we do because of our past. The effects of our parents affect us. It's very genetic when you stop to think about it. For myself and for each one of you. 
because my father was a sinner and my mother was a sinner when they came together to procreate me there was no question about it I also would be a sinner I have no control over that I am what I am because of that element of my past but there's another part of my past there's another part of your past that perhaps you, I, we run away from. Because like Hagar, there have been those decisions that we have made in the past that we wish we had not made. There were those things that we said that we wish we hadn't said. Words are funny like that, aren't they? We speak them and they go out from us. And sometimes the moment we say them, we wish we could reach out and grab them. And we wish we could bring them back. Has anyone ever felt that way? I suppose some have felt that way. But the moment they're gone, they're gone. It's like a text message. Now, maybe you've never done this, but others, perhaps in other places, not here, have actually done something like this. They read a text message. They got mad. They were angry. They wanted to give somebody a piece of their mind, and they start texting. You know how people text real fast, don't you? I'm not a fast texter. I watch my children. They text quickly, and those thumbs are moving quickly. And then, what's the next thing that they do? Hit the send button, and it's gone. And sometimes, as soon as we do that, we say, oh no, I wish I hadn't sent that. Sometimes we make those decisions, and they haunt us from our past. Sometimes it's things that we say. Sometimes it's things that we have done. We've done some horrible things. Sometimes people know about them. Sometimes people don't know about them. And sometimes we do things that we wish we could take back. Hagar was running from her past. There's some of you who are running from your past. And now you are in your current situation. You see the past. You're now in the present, and you're saying, what will I do about the future? I have no hope. I see no future. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Guess what? God sees that we are shaped by our past. It haunts us. It bothers us. It plays with our minds. God sees something else also. Not only does he see that our past shapes us, but he sees the challenges that we face in life. He sees the difficulties that we experience. He sees that there are many of you who have financial struggles. You don't know how you're going to pay this semester's tuition bill. Your parents spend days and nights wrestling, working hard, praying, asking God, how am I going to take care of my son's, my daughter's tuition? There are other life challenges that we face. We have parents who are ailing. Some of us have physical ailments. 
I could create a whole long list of challenges. But each one of us knows and understands and recognizes that life is filled with difficulties. Life throws challenges our way. We face spiritual difficulties, spiritual challenges. We live our lives trying to please God, but somehow, some way, the same temptation pops up, trips us up, and we fall over on our faces. Like a little baby, we get back up, we start walking, and we try, we, 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 we try to walk, we let go, and then we try to go a little farther and we fall down. Once again, God sees the challenges that we face. Ah, but there are two more things that I want to talk about this morning that God sees. God also sees the future. He saw that for Hagar. Because when you read between the lines of the story, it may very well be that Hagar did not know, um, certainly not in the beginning, um, she did not know of her pregnancy. She knew later on, and certainly by this time she knows, but she does not know what the future holds for her. She does not know what the future holds for that child. Will we be able to eat? Will we be able to be sustained? What will happen to us? What will our future be? And here the angel of the Lord says, have no fear. I know that you taunted Sarah in the past, but I am ready and I am willing and I am able to put your past in the past. You only see the future, uh, the, the present, but the future is a great future for you and your child. I think of the words found in Jeremiah chapter 29. When the children of Israel had been taken away into captivity, they also, the, the, the southern kingdom, had been taken away into captivity, and they did not know what their future was. And under inspiration, they were told to just go ahead, build homes, inhabit them, plant fruit, enjoy, uh, 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 plant crops, enjoy the growth of those crops. Because, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know the plans that I have for you. I have a great future for you. For when the 70 years are accomplished, I will bring you out from this captivity and I will reestablish you in your land. I know the plans that I have for you, Jeremiah says. And that's what the angel is saying here to Hagar. I have a plan for you. I have a future for you. Hagar needed to hear that. Hagar needed to know that because, once again, she only saw the past. She only saw the present. But now God is saying to her, I see your future. And I have plans for your future. And last but not least, in verse 11, as we read earlier, you are with child, you will bear a son, and the verse continues on moving into verse 12. One last thing that God sees for us, just as he saw for Hagar, he sees for us. God sees joy. God sees the blessings that he has for our future. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but what comes in the morning? Joy 
comes in the morning. I'm not concerned, God says, about your past. I'm not concerned ultimately about your present. I am ultimately concerned about the future that I have for you. I see your future and then the light dawns for Hagar. You are the God who sees. This morning, you and I have reasons to rejoice. We have reason to praise God. And we can praise him, and praise indeed comes into our hearts when we recognize that God sees. Hagar recognized this. And as a result of recognizing this, the sorrow of yesterday, the sorrow of today, turned into the joy of today and tomorrow. I praise you, God, she was able to say, because now I know who you are. You are the God who sees. I don't have to worry about today. I don't have to worry about tomorrow, because you see my future. We also have reason to rejoice because we serve a God who has always seen our future. Our past was no surprise to him. He saw that. Our present is no surprise to him. He saw that coming too. But I'm so glad that not only has God seen our future, but he has been in charge of my past, my present, and my future, even when it doesn't seem to be the case. Today, there are many of us sitting here who don't know what the future holds. You're sitting here and you're wrestling with some things some doubts, some fears, some concerns. Some of you are disheartened. Some of you are dismayed. You don't know what tomorrow, what next week, what next month brings. The story of Hagar is a beautiful story. And it's beautiful not because of Hagar, not because of Sarah, not because of Abraham. This story is beautiful because of God. Because God is the God who sees. We must always keep in mind that God is omniscient. He's all wise. He is too brilliant to make a mistake. He is too wise to err. This then calls for a life walk of faith. We are Christians. Many of us are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And we have learned that this life is a life of faith. This requires a walk of faith because none of us sees the future but God sees the future so when we study the story of Hagar we are reminded that we can trust God we are reminded that we can depend on him we are reminded that we serve a God who forgives our past. We serve a God who removes from us the guilt of our decisions. We serve and can trust a God who sees the future.
for us. He can and he will shape our future for his glory. Do you appreciate a God who sees your future? If you do, I just want to see you raise your hand right now. The God that we love, the God that we serve, sees everything that touches our lives, that touches our being, that touches our experience. And that's the God that we love, worship, and serve. May God bless us to always see the God who sees.